thing here as well. Anyway, what can I say? Uh, welcome aboard, everybody. Um, I see some of our panelists in the house. I see Dr. Story. I did see her. You there? Um, I see my man, Dr. Ricky Jones. Let, let, let me hear from you. Let me just make sure I can. we can hear you. I think my mic is disabled. No, I just heard you just right now. Did, I okay. saw Kyla just a second I'm ago. I'm here. Yeah, hey. I'm here. Hey. Uh, hey. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> What's Not going good. on? Hey, we don't have your uh, we don't have your picture. We don't have your video up. I know. I'm trying to choose the background. You know how I do. Oh, I got you. I ain't, I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Do I see? Uh, is uh, let's see. Is Renee with us? Renee Richardson, our other panelists. I'm here. I'm in the airport. Uh, so oh, I she's doing that. It, unless I'm ah. Okay. 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 All right. All right. So I did see a, a email you sent earlier. So you'll. Uh, so you're at the airport. So about how long you think you'll be around? Let me just try to figure that out in terms of how we're going to order these questions. I should be here for the majority of it. They changed the flight uh, time. Okay. Just uh, about 30 minutes ago. So okay. I was okay. speaking for right. most of it. Okay. All right. Cool. 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 Well, welcome aboard, everybody. And let's see. What do I want to do? Uh, we see you now, Kyla. So that's great. Uh, so let me put something up on the board. If I can find it. Wait a minute. Hold on. Give me just a half a second. Uh-huh. And uh, where is what I'm looking for at? I think it's here. All right. Okay. Okay, so uh, the way this thing is working, um, I can't really see what you all see, so I want you all to tell me. Do you all see uh, this PowerPoint up? Yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And then I guess what, our, our, our faces are somewhere along the screen or something like that? I can't really see it from my angle. Um, anyway... So, uh, all right, so officially, uh, welcome to uh, volume two of You're showing our... three, though, to Kwame. Say it one more time. You're showing volume three on Asada. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. We're going to get up to that. Um, okay. Because I want to, you know, I want to do a little bit of... So, so, yeah, here's where we are, here's where we are. But just at the beginning, just in terms of what we're doing. Uh, so, um, like I said, this is volume two of a series that we started here. Uh, at, at, at the Pan African Studies Department uh, here at the University of Louisville, uh, Conversations in Black. We had our first one a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, actually. Uh, what is the Black Studies canon? That was just the very beginning of a, of a conversation. We're going to be continuing as we continue this series, not necessarily in that format. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, we got some things on the table, I think in terms of some of the things that we want to try to accomplish there as well. So uh, some people may have caught that. Uh, uh, and uh, anyway, that's, like I said, we'll be going on. As a matter of fact, uh, the, 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 so <clears throat> we're going to do our first book, which some of us, many of us probably would feel belongs in a Black Studies canon. The Autobiography of Asada Shakur. That's three weeks from now. So we're doing this again. And so even though I was not enough space on the flyer, you know, to say, hey, this is actually, you know, what? Volume two of, uh, of, 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 of what is the Black Studies canon? It's still kind of a part of that. Um, I don't have a flyer up yet, but then also then in December, we're going to do volume four. Also on, uh, uh, we're going to come back to the Black Studies canon. We're going to come at it from a different angle have some different faculty a part of that conversation. So uh, in terms of the series coming on, I mentioned this last time, I'm, I'll, I'll say this again, really the entire series kind of really was built on uh, uh, gaining some experience with the medium and establishing a, a sort of track record for what really will be our big event uh, in this Pan-African, in this PAS and Friends Conversation in Black series, and that's uh, this tribute to Malcolm X we're going to do in February. It's going to go all day. And so a lot of details will be forthcoming, but the date is set, February 21st, the day after, you know, the the the, the, the commercial the day after 
uh, uh, he was assassinated. So anyway, that's uh, uh, that's a uh, that's something coming up in February that we're definitely going to do. So anyway, yes, yeah, so I saw that in three weeks, and so anyway, that brings us a, a bit up to date to today. Um, so our conversation today, of uh, Volume Two of Conversations in Black Elections, Ethnicity, and Empire, as we know. Uh, the story of the U.S. elections, particularly the presidential election, really one of the major stories, uh, if not the top story, uh, in what shall we say, like the news today. So um, I want to start out, folks, and I can, I'm going to stop this because we'll, we'll come back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, I want to start really with our panelists. Um, I said, hey, got opening thoughts. Like somebody said, hey, what are your thoughts on this upcoming election? Like, what would be your, what would be some initial points that you might make on that before we get to our agenda, which I sent you all already? I'm going to choose somebody to go first. I'm going to choose Kyla. You go first. No, but okay, that's fine. Um... <laughs> So what are some initial thoughts about the upcoming election? Well, if you have any, you can um, pass if you wanted to. No, I mean, I think that um, the upcoming election is crucial and critical in ways that uh, we've just never seen before. Um, 45's plan, um, Trump's plan to in install Project 2025, defund the Department of Education, um, institute more laws against uh, folks who give birth and not giving limiting reproductive choices, even though they've already been limited. Um, uh, I'm just, I mean, it's a really like scary um, election as it has been in previous elections right before this as well. Um, it's scary. I'm hoping folks um, do the right thing. I'm sick of the news saying everything is neck and neck. I just, I feel like one candidate is a buffoon and a hate monger, and um, the other candidate might leave some things to be desired, but certainly much more experienced, smarter, capable. Um, and so I'm not sure why um, it's this neck and neck thing other than anti-Blackness, misogyny, and um, homophobia, and, and again, xenophobia, all those things. So Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Dr. Rick, what you got for us? Yeah. I I mean, I certainly understand the the belief, you know, and the the continued push that, you know, this is a, a relatively unique election. I am not completely convinced that it is, other than the fact that, you know, we have a, a black woman on the ticket. Um, but when you look at her record and her ideology, you know, it's not like she's a, a Sada Shakur. You know, she is uh, <laughs> basically a, a person who is who has been a part of this system for some time, but I'm sure we'll we'll get to that. Um, look, I'm kind of fascinated by the thought that something new is going on in the country now, socially or politically. You know, Donald Trump was born in 1946. White supremacy was around long before that. It's been around since that, and it's going to be around once Trump is off the, the political stage. So I think uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates said something recently that, you know, many of us in the academy have been saying for a long time, certainly political scientists have, that so much of politics takes place before people go into the voting booth. You know, that old Howard Laswell definition, politics is the process that decides who gets what, when, where, or how. And if black folk in particular, because that's the constituency that I'm ultimately concerned with, limit ourselves to the voting booth or even limit ourselves to allegiance to either of these parties. Now, now I'm not, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me because I'm not saying that anybody should go out and support Donald Trump, that anybody should support the Republicans because people get misunderstood very, very uh, quickly. You know, I see some of these polls that talk about upwards of 25, 26% of black men are, you know, in the tank for Donald Trump. I don't believe that is true. It has opened the door for black men to be bashed once again. We saw Barack Obama do it again the other day. I find that highly problematic. 
But for us, man, I think to sum it up without going too long, this is the beginning of another seven days to plot. You know, that that's the way I put it. I think black folk who have any awareness of history and politics, we're astute at all, understand that the Democrats will kill us. But they'll wait until next week. The Republicans will do it tonight. So every time we vote for the Democrats, we just vote for seven more days to plot. So I think black folk better get to plotting. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. And Renee, we definitely wanted you as a part of this panel. Because, I mean, you kind of have a long history as like a voter registration activist, right? So, you know, you're someone who's certainly been deeply invested in the electoral process for much of your adult life. So, yes, this is probably the first election I have not registered voters since 2008. Um, Yeah, I haven't worked on a campaign, but uh, quite busy, right? Uh, (laughs) Trying to finish this degree. Um, I I think I'm in line with what Dr. Jones and Dr. Sori said. Um, essentially, you know, we live in an empire masquerading as a democratic republic. So at a certain point, we still have to participate and as he said, like hold off some of the, the worst of the worst of the things that could happen politically. And I definitely think 45 and all of his people are the worst of things that can happen politically to us. They already tried some stuff and it didn't work. So now they're revving up again with some some new activities that have already happened in the states. And my concern is if these things go across federally, which is their plan, I don't know how much, uh, how many more seven days we got left, Dr. Jones, (laughs) if if they keep that up. So for me, I'm very much just ready to get 45 off the political stage, ready for that to, ready to move on so we can get back to some more normal addressing of policies and not whatever this is. Okay. So that's, okay. that's how I feel. <laughs> all right. No, great, great, great. No, no, I just wanted to, you know, like I said, I, get, I sent you all uh, the kind of list of issues I wanted to engage in. And so I wanted, you know, that might not cover everything that you all were interested in. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to get that at the top. So those those will get some points. So we're going to go back to our PowerPoint and go through our agenda. Um, and so here we go. There's item one. And all, in, anybody feel free to, to, to address this question that I was kind of seeing. I mean, I'm so, so just, I mean, I'm someone who has not tended uh, to pay a great deal of attention uh, to the electoral cycles, uh, uh, but quite naturally, just as a as a storyline uh, in the media, uh, you know, you can't help but pay, you know, uh, catch on to some things. So, uh, uh, so this is this is a no. I, I'm not gonna lie. This is not a serious question. But like, what is the politics of joy? <laughs> Hey man, it's, it's it's like going back to, I don't know, don't worry, be happy or something, you know. Well, I mean, I don't think it's that superficial. Like a part of me, um, one that's like what, an that, an emerging. What? Well, the politics of joy, right? They they like in academia, uh, black joy, right, is an academic endeavor, right? That our joyousness us us as black people. I don't think that Kamala's using it in this way. She's clearly using it to counter the message of this country is in the shithole. Um, Immigrants are taking over. Like Trump and Vance's messaging is very doomsday, that the country is in the toilet, that everything is amok because of the Biden administration. Life isn't happy. The economy is trash. Like, so everything is negative. Um, And so I think that Harris and Walsh counter to that is joy um on top of that there they were really coming for her laugh the fact that every time she was interviewed or on stage she laughs she smiles um and they are angry about that they're they're angry about that and i i think that for me i've noticed that within my own self like as um an exuberant type of black woman um i think that makes people feel strange i think that um, 
I think that they're just not used to black people walking around being happy. They want to see black people either walking around angry or they want them to be with their heads down and despondent and, oh, my God, the racial oppression. I can't, you know, um, I mean, so it, the, this idea that um, you have the this minoritized woman um, who is celebratory and exuberant and all of that. And we know during enslavement um, that joy was something that was outlawed for enslaved Africans. I mean, so I, I don't think that Harris don't get it wrong. I don't think that she um, and her campaign are doing this in response to this kind of anti-blackness in regards to joy and excitement. I think they're doing it to counter 45 in them. Um, but at the same vein, I think she has a smart team. I think she has a young team and they know on social media, this idea of black joy, black freedom, right, is a hot uh, thing right now. And it's something that uh, people are talking about, black boy joy, especially um, mm -hmm. black carefree black girl. It goes with those, all of those um, kind of things that have been these kind of community endeavors and initiatives saying that regardless of anti-blackness or misogyny or or these things that we still are enjoying our lives and we are still thriving um, despite that, right? Hers is about the country in and of itself that she sees hope on the horizon and all of those kind of things. But, you know, um, I think that that's what they're they're trying to do is is basically be a counter to what Vance and 45 are trying okay. to okay. do. Okay, okay. Some real fast. Kyla, yeah. are, are, are you are you tying uh, you know, this slogan, which was largely a, a democratic national, you know, committee gathering slogan, this politics of joy. Are you are you saying I'm trying to make sure I'm hearing you right. Are you are you tying that slogan or do you think they're tying that slogan to some of the black joy pushes that that, that we've seen come out in recent years? Um, I think so. Um, and if they aren't doing it intentionally, that's how it seems to be landing um, with young people um, on social media. And so when they are like retweeting it and doing stuff, they're like saying like politics of joy, black boy joy, black girl joy. So they're interpreting it that way. Now, no, I don't think that it was this like research decision, right? Because I, I see the similarities in Obama, who was the change candidate. Um, and hope for change and make a difference, right? It's the same type of uh, rhetoric. Um, but I think when Walsh said that the other side is nothing but a bunch of grumpy, mean, mad men, I think they kind of implored that. I think that Harris has a young team uh, behind her and that's where she's getting some of this um, stuff. I don't feel like no so you're not misunderstanding i don't think that she was intentionally like i'm black and so therefore black boy joy black girl freedom like no i think it is a counter to 45 in them but i think that it's landing in that kind of way with with young uh voters of color i think okay yeah you got thoughts i yeah. was gonna ask renee if she had thoughts about oh, it oh renee go ahead yeah 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 go ahead so I can uh, confirm that many of the people that work for Harris in the camp on the campaign side are about 34 to 40. Um, and many of them have worked on other campaigns, including the Obama campaign. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of overlap there. Um, maybe not intentionally in the way we would see it in the like academy, like this studying of black people and joyfulness and what that means. But just also the other side to that is a lot of people were tapped out on this election. Like it was pretty much a rerun when Biden was still in, people were already over it. So when when the focus became hit, and she was kind of out of the way, <laughs> uh, frankly, but when the focus was put on Harris, a lot of people felt like this sense of like a new energy, a new excitement per se. Me, I mean, I'm going to vote regardless, but people who are not generally, like, paying attention, they did feel a sense of, like, okay, this this feels different. This feels not as sad and gloomy as it did before. And that I did notice that as someone who's just going to pay attention regardless, I saw more people who are normally not engaged being engaged in it because it did feel less tense, I would guess I would say, than it did before. So, those would be nice. Ricky, Ricky, I know you want to get in. I just want to, uh, I just want, I, my only, my only contribution to this one is like, man, I hear y'all, but this right here is a very sensitive photograph to me. 
if, if this is the politics of joy, right? I don't think I want it. <laughs> Ricky. I, I, I think it's where you're coming from, man. You know, uh, and, and, and I have to admit that I've probably uh, devolved into this this mad, gloomy, angry, curmudgeon brother. I've been around to Quame too long, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I reject most of those adjectives as a description of myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I think I might have been at this, pol this politics game for too long, too. I've never... I've never been um, the, the Obama campaigning messaging, nor the reality of Obama hit the same for me as it did a, a lot of a lot of folk, you know, and and I voted for him twice. Right. And, and would again. And the, the, the Harris, the, the, the Harris joyfulness doesn't hit for me the same either. You know, uh, I'm. I'm very vigilant and not necessarily nihilistic, but but very, very careful right now because I've seen things happen under both Republicans and Democrats. And I do think as as a black boy myself, black man, whatever, I ain't got much reason to be joyful. I mean, I've seen what's happened nationally with the, the, the evisceration of affirmative action. I've seen you know, the stepping up of really anti-black movements, they might call it anti-woke, anti-CRT, anti-CRT, anti-DEI, all of that stuff is anti-blackness, and it's been successful, okay, during the Biden years. And I heard very little from that administration about black folk, very little. I heard very little pushback against these anti-black moves, you know, and so I hear very little right now from this campaign that targets black people, even less that says anything about black men. All black men are told, get your ass out and vote for this, this, this black woman. If you don't, you hate black women. You, you're you not supportive of black women. So I, you know, man, I want to be joyful. I mean, I, I do. I'm, 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 I'm drinking every day trying to find that joy in these politics, but I'm finding my joy in, in other places. But I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this as, as we go along, you know. And I remember, too, when Kamala Harris was a standalone candidate four years ago, she never pulled out of the single digits, even with black people. And so people's memories are really, really short. And so the question is, why was that? You know, I'm I'm very big on on taking deep dives into people's records. But again, you know, somebody at the University of Louisville told me, well, maybe you shouldn't do hold any position outside of Pan African Studies because the word on you is that you only care about black people. And I'm like, well, sh somebody got to care about them. Somebody got to fight for them. Somebody got to speak for them. And so, you know, I while again. Let me say, I am going to vote against Donald Trump next month. But I would have voted for Tequame's dog against Donald Trump. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to glorify the person who's running against Donald Trump where the issues that impact my people are concerned. So I'm not necessarily joyful about that. I In fact, that. I need to be, be more, more vigilant with a lot of the stuff that's going on, both locally, statewide, and nationally. Good point, good point. I think that leads into uh, our next slide. Uh, and this is something I think that Kyla has made reference to, certainly. This is part of the thing, right? So uh, this is certainly part of the rhetoric. Um, is that, well, I think for, based on what Kyla said, I think you would find this a convincing statement. Do, do, do we generally find this to be like a, a, a compelling reason to vote for the Democratic Party? I think so. I mean, I think that, and I, I agree with um, all of the things that uh, Ricky was saying. I mean, we've seen it here in Louisville uh, with the anti-DEI, the CRT. I mean, businesses preemptively uh, getting rid of their diversity, equity, and inclusion um, departments and just diversity, equity, and inclusion functioning as other minoritized people outside 
of Black people, right? So other groups that are, um, that experience, you know, systemic harm, um, they are literally intentionally moving away from putting Black people or Black Americans in that um, way. Um, just some of the stuff that 45 has said, though, with uh, just vote for me this election and you'll never have to vote again. Um, or, um, <laughs> you know, or um, the whole idea of, you know, you send your daughter to school and then she gets a transgender surgery um, and she comes home and is a boy. Um, you know, the Haitian immigrants are from a shithole country and um, they are taking over Springfield, Ohio. They're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats. I mean, like, um, his rhetoric and the fact that Vance, who I've always seen as a climber, okay, Vance will attach himself to anybody that is going to expand his pseudo fame and make him well known. Um, and just like him even saying, well, did he lose the 2020 election or did he not? And it's like he did, period. Um, uh, um, are the immigrants there in Springfield legally? Yes. Are they eating dogs and cats? No. Like the thing that's the most disturbing about the rhetoric, like I actually went and saw, or people are posting him on Twitter, when John McCain was running against Obama, he held a town hall meeting. And all of these people, namely white, were in the meeting saying, I don't trust him. He's an Arab. He's a Muslim. Oh, Hussein, Barack. You know, and so John McCain is like, hey, look, we differ on policy tremendously, but this is a good dude. He's a family guy. It's not time for all of the xenophobia and all of this, like he's Arab and all the all these things that just aren't true, all these things that are just not facts. And now we're in a space, right, with from 45 on down, like all of these anti-LGBT bills, anti-DEI bills, um, anti-CRT bills are all GOP, all of them. Not one of them um, in, at, at all has ever been Democratic or part of a Democratic administration, even at the state level. They're all from them. I mean, last year there were 550 anti-LGBTQ bills in 33 legislative houses, um, all of them GOP generated. And so this is their... Their entire platform to me, from state level to federal, this idea that somehow democracy means white, cis, straight, and men, right? Not, not women, but white, cis, straight men. That's what democracy, if black men are down for the misogyny and the homophobia and transphobia, you can come too. Um, but still recognize that you'll be in the background, right? Um, so are there's you just a about lot Mark of Robinson. No, no. I mean, to me, the, the, well, the thing that's disturbing about the young black dudes like critique that I've been seeing all over TikTok has less to do with this current administration backing down on Palestine. Like I can see those things, but they're not even saying that. They're saying, well, all the other countries is run by men. So we're going to look weak as fuck when we got a country run by a woman. Blatant misogyny, stupidity. Um, the other, the other rhetoric is she locked all these black men in jail. So it's like, so what do, what do you think Trump does? Because what was the Central Park Five? What was him not renting um, apartments in New York, right? So like, you somehow don't see his routine and longstanding and very public and very known racism, but you're willing to kind of step that aside to talk about a stimulus check that was from a Democratic Congress that he put his name on and that he made less. Like, they, it's almost like they feel like they can just say anything and because they say it, then it's a, like a fact. Like, you know, I, I put a meme up the other day where we're in a climate where you say, this is a scientific fact. And someone's like, I personally disagree. No, these fools are these fools are talking about there's no such thing as climate change with all these hurricanes. They like actually the hurricane, the Democrats is making the hurricanes happen to make 45 look bad. It's like all of y'all sound like fools. Like to me, like where is the genuine critique? Like Ricky's critique is a genuine, real critique that it's evidentiary, right? That Democrats have not had our best interests. And it doesn't mean that the Democratic Party somehow is not anti-Black, which we know they are, right? It's just the fact of the matter that this fool's talking about mass deportation right away. I mean, he, I mean, shit, I don't know. I just, I just I think you, that my, my Black gay tail gonna be locked up in somebody's prison just because I'm Black and gay is, if this fool is elected. I mean, so I just, um, I think that 
I don't know. I, yeah, I think it's, cool. it's just it's cool. too dangerous. And so I do. Okay. I think that this idea of a, dem- a democracy, even though we have never as a country been able to enact a democracy in a true form, we've never been able to do that, Democrat or Republican. I just think that the other side would really erode like voting and <laughs> Americans having a say. And I know that that's already limited. I just think it would be more so okay. with the other okay. administration. Renee, is, a, is American democracy a stake? In this election, if you don't vote for the Democratic Party, I'm not. I'm not gonna co-sign maybe that last part about just simply voting for the Democratic Party. But I definitely do think the democracy, air quotes, is it safe? One, people can't read. Like literacy is down, so they believe anything they hear. They heard that, like, like Dr. Story said, they heard that people was eating dogs and cats, and they ran with it. No fact checking, no, no obvious concern about well, where did you get that from? No asking questions. They heard somebody say that and they took it as fact. So for me, yeah, like I think if you keep voting for the Republicans, we'll continue to have schools that don't have books, that don't teach them anything. So now they don't even have like a basic set of facts. Hmm. Like we're in a well, somebody said it yes, somebody said it this week. We're like a post literate society. Mm. And it's very hard to maintain any type of democracy if people cannot read or think or evaluate any type of information for themselves. Mm. But that's mm. by design. That's not by accident. Look at mm. the book bans. Look at again what's going on locally and across the states. If this is passed federally, I just don't <laughs> don't know how we will be able to turn it back around. That's that's my opinion. So, yeah, specifically looking at the literacy part, there's not too many uh, countries, empires, whatever, that have had a lot of people that could not read and understand what they were reading, make it past, like make it past these kinds of problems. So I think there's like just like a basic core issue in the society. So if we keep voting for people, that support, like removing efforts to improve literacy, then we're going to have lo- larger problems down the road. Okay, okay, Ricky, I, I think I think you you would say no, it's not quite like that. I don't think you would agree with the proposition that American democracy is at stake. It doesn't sound like. Well, there are a few things I'm trying to order my thoughts here and be as succinct as possible. The uh, anarchist side of me says so what <laughs> you know if 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 american democracy as it has always functioned with regards to my people is blown the hell up so what i you know i'm i'm willing to start over and rebuild that though i think that a lot of what the democrats are saying on democracy is at stake is is a bit hyperbolic you know And I also think it is highly problematic to reduce the idea, if it is indeed at stake, to boil that down to the fortunes or misfortunes of one candidate. Because whether Donald Trump is elected or not, that agenda remains, right? It's very much like uh, I've had, man, four or five Republicans in the last few weeks, and I guess they think this is endearing, or at least former Republicans who have been in conversation with me, it's like, man, I had to leave the party, you know, Donald Trump, you know, just made me leave the party. I'm like, well, well, what took you so long, bro? You know, I mean, when Strom Thurmond flipped over, that didn't make you leave the party? Did people like Trent Lott not make you leave the party? Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, you know, Lee Atwater didn't make you leave the party. Ronald Reagan didn't make you leave the party. Mitch Mitch McConnell, Rand Paul didn't make you leave the party. W. Didn't make you, you you lead a party. Carl Rove didn't make you lead a party. And now we got, you know, a, a Democratic presidential candidate trotting around campaigning with uh, uh, Liz and Dick Cheney. You know, so all of this stuff gets kind of flipped on its head. So if, look, so I challenge any Democrat who is worth his or her salt, who is so wedded to this campaign, and you have any sense of politics, history, and struggle, and you see your candidate buddying up to Liz Cheney and saying to Dick Cheney, thank you for what you have done for this country. 
Ooh. And you think I didn't hear that. Oh, yeah. And you think I'm going to be all in with that? Again, you can have my vote, but you can't have my soul because I understand the other side is bad. But if the Democrats are going to constantly say, yeah, if they real honest, which these people all have, you know, a very troubled relationship with the truth and accuracy, you know, in, in scale and scope. But if the Democrats were honest, they would say, OK, black people, we know we're jacked up. We know we're no good, but we're better than those other guys. And if that's the best you can do, then, OK, I can support you in my defiance of supporting the other side. So, again, let me say again, this is not support of the Republicans, but that doesn't should not neuter critique of the Dems. Right. Lastly, that's a longer conversation is one that is continuously repeated because it's almost like it's a zero sum game and you can't offer any critique of the Democrats or even Kamala Harris. If you say, hey, I got some questions about Kamala Harris from legitimate historical and political research. And the people from the other side come back, nah, she went to Howard. Shut up. Nah, she an AKA. Shut up. You know, nah, you know, she run against Trump. Shut up. You know, that that that's a little insane to me. And lastly, I would say this. I know, I know, because this is since I'm, I'm a black man, right? I'm a black man who who's always who was raised by black women, who loves black women, you know, who spends time with black women as often as I can. You know, I know that there are people like the Lil Wayne's and the Kodak Blacks of the world and, and 50 Cent has flirted with it, Ice Cube has flirted with it, you know, your, your rappers and, and some fools. But I, I would caution folks from looking at what I seriously believe are anomalous cases of black men who are openly misogynistic, you know, um, openly just anti-woman, they've always existed, and those who are in the tank for Trump. They exist, Mark Robinson exists, Byron Donalds exists, Tim Scott exists, but I do not believe that they, not only are they not representative of the majority of us, I'm saying those guys are in the stark minority. So, you know, I, I would just hope, especially for my sisters, that we don't have this bleeding effect where there's this thought that, you know, all these brothers are running around like, yeah, yeah, you, we ain't gonna follow no woman and, and we'll be weak if this, that. Cause you know, there's a lot of weak brothers. It's, it's a lot of weak white boys, white women, all these people. So nobody is, I ain't gonna say nobody, but the majority of us, are smart enough, caring enough, astute enough, and most of all, loving enough of our black women not to dismiss a black woman simply because she's a black woman. Who that on your shirt, man? That's Baldwin. Who? James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who that? Can y'all read it? I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't I believe what you say because I see what you do. Yeah, uh -huh. I can't. Just say because that's what you do. Yeah. There you go. All right. All right. Well, that's yeah. a transition. Let's go to somebody else from his generation. If this works. And uh, let's have, you know, someone we all know and love dear speak to us. So let's uh let's listen to this guy for about a minute as he speaks on the question of American democracy. Don't scare Negroes to date with no badge or no white skin or no white sheet or no white anything else. The police the same way. They put their club upside your head and then turn around and accuse you of attacking them. Every case of police brutality against a Negro follows the same pattern. They attack you, bust you all upside your mouth, and then take you to court and charge you with assault. What kind of democracy is that? What kind of uh, freedom is that? What kind of social or political system is it when a black man has no voice in court, has no nothing on his side other than what the white man chooses to give him? My brothers and sisters, we have to put a stop to this. And it will never be stopped until we stop it ourselves. They attack the victim. And then the criminal who attacked the victim accuses the victim of attacking him. 
This is American justice. Yes, right. This is American democracy. Yes, right. And those of you who are familiar with it, yes. know that in America, democracy is hypocrisy. Yes, right. Now, if I'm wrong, put me in jail. But if you can't prove that if democracy is not hypocrisy, then don't put your hands on me. <laughs> There's a boy. Here he is. There's a boy. Uh, uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, that was 60 years ago. Uh, but he has something to say about this conversation, and I wonder, uh, uh, I wonder what we take him to mean by that, and whether we actually would agree with him. Um, he says, in America, democracy is hypocrisy. I think there's a lot that he could be meaning by that. Uh, I think I agree with him, though. You know, if we're talking about the history of the country. Uh, anyway, let me stop. Let me stop and get your all's reaction, and maybe I have something else to say. Democracy is hypocrisy. That has some relevance to our, uh, to our conversation, I think. All of this is hypocrisy. I mean, of course, we, we know that, that Malcolm was right. American democracy is hypocrisy. American education is hypocritical. The mm. Where we work right now is hypocritical. You just saw a situation at Princeton where Rua Benjamin wins a McCarthy uh, uh, fellowship and Princeton wants to celebrate her. And Rua says, nah, you ain't going to celebrate me publicly. I'm going to tell the story about how the very morning that I, I received the award, you got knowledge of it, want to announce it, you rolling me about supporting students who are speaking out against what's going on in, in Gaza, right? You want to stop me from having free speech, and then you want to, you know, openly in public celebrate me about an award that's based on free speech and my activism. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's incredible hypocrisy. All of it, right? And so that's why I said in the previous segment, if you're talking about American democracy is at stake, I don't give a damn <laughs> if American democracy as we know it is at stake. It needs to be at stake, quite frankly, right? And so that we can reimagine it. So this is the biggest thing for me, not completely getting caught up in these Democratic Party tropes. Uh, you got to support us because we're your best hope. Nah, man, I've been a hoe. All right. Me, I've been a male whore. I know what it's like to visit women late at night, you know, when I need something from them and then never return until I need something again. And that's the way the Democratic Party handles us. They come and see us every two, four, six years when they need something, and then we don't hear nothing from them again until it's time to pimp us out again. That's the way it is. So when you say that, people say, oh, well, you supporting the Republicans. No, they guerrilla pimps, right? They pimping hoes, slamming Cadillac those. They worse than the Democrats, but it don't mean that all of them ain't pimps. So don't come talking to me about this you know, I need you to preserve democracy. What you're really saying to me is you need me to help you preserve white supremacy. And everything that we see in politics and education, right, in the, in the criminal justice system, white supremacy, where white people are the yep. ones who know yep. and decide. And when, even when you got a black woman, put the picture up again. Show me the brother around her on that stage. Oh, yeah. Show me the brother around her on that stage. And you want me to be joyful about that? I mean, no, I, I hope some knows, right? Again, and fight for seven more days to plot. It might be seven hours, but I'm giving myself a little bit of time so I can figure out how to get all of them off my back. Yeah, I think you got to I'm the so heart glad of what we're I talking about. Let, uh, let me get this in, uh, Renee. I see. Uh, sure. I think you got to the heart of what he was saying about uh, uh, when he says democracy is hypocrisy when you tie that directly to white supremacy. Uh, I mean, this is what American democracy has meant, white supremacy. And so from that standpoint, uh, playing that game, buying into that rhetoric for black people was a losing game. Uh, so I like that. Renee, you had something. I'm so glad we're talking about people talking black and dating white, because there's a lot of that in the Black Studies canon. 
it's a lot of people that talk about revolution, this, that, and the third, but don't uh-huh. actually get down to the business because they're not doing it at home and in their personal lives. So when uh-huh. you think about what Tanahashi said about much of what we do politically is before we hit the voting booths, I haven't heard anybody really like championing the Democratic Party on here. So I'm not sure why we having that particular conversation. We're talking about what's at stake like right now. And that's more than what's going on federally. What are you individually doing at the local level? Where are you participating at politically and socially? Because I know what I'm doing and it's what I've always done. I've always participated with young people, making sure young people voted, making sure they knew where to vote, how to vote. Not just voting, but also, okay, what are you doing at work? How many people at work or in schools where you had the opportunity to stand up for yourself, you didn't, you shrank, you sat back. Some people on this call too. So like, it's cute when we're talking about, oh, let the empire fall, but who is it going to fall on first? Who is going to be, who is going to be the one that has to deal with that first? And I do want to address one more thing. It's one thing to tell the sisters, oh, don't hold us to the standards of these particular black brothers. Well, tell them to be quiet. Don't come talking to us. Don't come telling us what we shouldn't. We know what we experience on the day to day. It's not just what's being said, but also how people treat us. It's also how people look at us. And I'm not here to take up for Harris because I never wanted to vote for Harris. She would have never been my pick. This is where we at, though. We already at the at the end of the road. The primaries are done. This is where we are. So I'm not using Harris as like my bar, but I know how people treat black women in positions that they share on the day to day basis. I don't need this campaign to tell me how people feel about me that look like me or as bright and smart as me and talented and what we do when we see mediocre men walking around and how much support they get. So let's 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 be mindful about that. It's not just this election. It's what people experience on the day to day throughout their lives that is animated or coming out during this election. Let me respond to that really quickly, because that's an interesting argument about brothers who are fools. Right. And who responds to them and how. And that's a hell of a burden to put on the lion's share of black men when we say tell them to be quiet, because many of us do. Personally, I ain't ran into nobody that is supporting Donald Trump. I don't know nobody who know nobody who's supporting Donald Trump as a black man. And if I ran into somebody who was down with it, I would. I ain't got no problem. I mean, I'm 6'2", 205. Be like, bruh, you need to get your damn mind right, partner. But to put that on black men, it would be completely unfair, I think, for us to flip that script and say to black women, hey, you saw that bullshit that Condoleezza Rice did? Why didn't y'all talk about it? You see all this bullshit that Candace Owens is doing right now? Why do y'all tell her to be quiet? You saw that bullshit that Sap Diamond and Silk were doing before one of them died? What's the problem with that? You know, we can't handle each other like that. It's it's a completely unfair standard. Lastly, what are we doing? Everybody, I would imagine, on this call are about the black mind. There is nothing, to my thinking, that is more important than people who are working to try to liberate black minds. That's what the Black Studies Project is all about, whether you're in California, Maine, Kentucky, or Canada. We are always trying to speak to people's minds because the American educational system is one that is set up to socialize people to bow to the existing system. So the conversations consistently get diverted. I just wrote about this when I transferred from the Naval Academy and went to Morehouse and Alton Hornsby. I'm sure you knew Hornsby to Kwame. He was like, I ain't taking your history from the Naval Academy because I know it didn't teach you nothing about black folk. You got to learn something about your people. So you taking this history down here at Morehouse because I know you're miseducated right now and I can't let you leave here in that condition. And so this is why for years I've told people in my department, we need to be over at Grandmar every day, punching mugs in the face. But every time we're in the classroom, I've gone to Kyla Story's classroom. She bringing it to her students, trying to create people who think in a tie to the Black Humanization Project. Yvonne Jones has been doing it since 1974 here at the University of Louisville. It doesn't matter whether you joyful or you cantankerous like me and Tequame. If you teaching about black folk from the perspective of black folk, you trying to liberate black folk. So folk who going around, hey, I registered 10 people to vote. Good on you. I done taught thousands of motherfuckers over the years to try to think and liberate themselves and the people around them. All of us have to be committed to that. And I think everybody on this call is committed to that. And so we can't be thin skinned, not as men nor as women. When we check one another, then let's drink and let's go out here and fight together. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that is so incredibly key. 
Tyler, what you got? What's your thoughts on this? What do you, how do you respond to Brother Malcolm in this ensuing conversation? Well, I think America, that Malcolm... democracy is hypocrisy. <laughs> well, I agree with that, of course, um, in the sense that democracy was thought about without black people in mind. Uh, you know, in, our, in the Constitution, black people are three fifths. And when Thomas J and everybody's doing that flowery language in the Constitution, they are not thinking about black people and life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. That was not about black people. Uh, when they think about education, it was not about black people. Black people prevented for several years not to be formally educated in any regard. Um, so even educating black people in any formal sense has been a battle. Um, I do think that uh, white supremacy is the undercurrent not only of American democracy, but also this country. Um, and I think that anti-blackness is in, in tandem with that, uh, of course, you know. Um, and so um, I do. I, I, I agree with Ricky in the sense that, you know, when he's saying like, well, if democracy goes in the toilet, who cares? Because that does create a potential for imaginative um, possibility. Um, I think that imagination, though, would be limited if we have that other party in the White House. But nonetheless, uh, we've had people in the White House um, who've done those things like Reagan, right? Um, I mean, before he's president, he fires Angela Davis from the University of California, right? And has the FBI raid her shit um, and steal her dissertation and humiliate her, right? I mean, um, so... I think that it's a long-standing white supremacy is a long-standing endeavor and project, and they want to secure it um, in all ways and at all costs. And I do think that Democratic uh, candidates pander to Black people and want Black people to kind of save the day every time it becomes critical, even though um, democracy and the democratic process isn't thought of with them in mind. And I think that it's it's immense pressure on that of black women, especially too, to do that. Um, they, you know, black women are save the country, black women do this, uh, you know, and I think that there are tons of black women who do like respond on social media to Candace Owens, to all of them and Mark Robinson. They, they tore him up, um, on Twitter with talking about he a black Nazi and, um, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and so they do respond and it, it is, and I, and I wonder if there's just a suppression of black men who are thoughtful um, about this election and that, you know, because sometimes I, I find that when they want to interview LGBT communities about stuff or or straight people about LGBT, they go to the most ignorant, ill-informed mm -hmm. population so then they can showcase, look, black people are more homophobic than white people. Black people are more exclusive. And right there, they're not as inclusive. as So there, there is a narrative, I think, um, that the press and the media want to kind of put out there. Um, and so that's what I've been seeing. I just haven't been seeing this balanced conversation, um, uh, maybe by folks like Hakeem Jeffries and people who are already in the white house and in Congress and that kind of thing, but just every day, um, you know, and I won't say that because they had the brother on MSNBC who was talking about the lack of civics education and, and now he has an immense following. So there have been some. Um, I just want it to be more. And I think that might have more to do with the way that stuff is being shown and the way that the, you know, press is going. But I do, I think there there's always, um, in my experience, there's always immense pressure for Black women to respond in a political way um, every single time to every single issue. And if we don't, um, then we're seen as like not smart or not capable or, you know, what's going on with black women. Um, I think there needs to be more scrutiny on these white women who keep electing this fool and keep him in the cycle. Um, I think there's absolutely no conversation or no kind of reprimanding. I wish Obama would have used that opportunity um, to talk about the fact that uh, white women historically and presently are always on the wrong side every single election, every single time. Um, so black women are really the only racial and gendered group who always vote on the right side every time. Um, and so I just, I don't, I don't know, um, about the, you know, these other groups, but, uh, they seem to not waver. Um, and I do, I, I mean, I'm with Renee in the sense that I'm not like, oh my God, I love Kamala. She's the, so impressive. I, I just can't wait. I can't wait to go to the polls and, you know, uh, you know, and be like all enthusiastic about it. But I know exactly who 
I will be uh, voting for, similar to Ricky and Renee both. Um, I think that the two-party system is a rotted system. I think that we need more options, more choices um, in that sense. Um, so it, it is. I, I mean, I really both the things that Ricky said and Renee said, um, I agree with, but I do, I, I feel like, um, there is this kind of immense pressure for black women just to respond to any political moment and always be astute, um, in their response. Um, and, and, you know, I see people like a, a Candace Owen and those fools, the, with the wigs who are like, I love Trump, I love, you know, who, whatever their names is. Um, seem to be more outliers than these like black dudes like Kanye, right? And Kodak Black and Ice Cube and Lil Wayne and Amigos and right and and the things they say, Ricky, they be saying stuff like, "There's no campaigning toward black men." Like, what about getting rid of child support? What about these baby? <laughs> I mean, it's so silly. Like the things that they say should be a part of a black man's political agenda just all seem to be couched in this kind of misogyny and, and sexism, this idea that somehow nobody's looking out for their interest. And, and the interest seemed to to be like misogyny and like, you well, know, black women don't want to be told what to do and that's their problem. And that's why it's easy to date white girls. I mean, it's always that. I mean, right, you well, even see the interracial couples in the store and the black dude be looking at you. It's like, girl, go on. Are we like, go. Okay. Are we back <laughs> to the beginning? I mean, I agree with you when you say that Candace Owens and, and Diamond and Silk and, and, and some of these other silly sisters are outliers. They absolutely are. But I'm, and I made this argument earlier, I'm going to make it again. These guys that you're talking about, their voices are amplified because America is obsessed with entertainment, but I think they are outliers too. They are not representative of the majority of black men. And statistically, I got you. And statistically, when we say that black women are the racial and gender group that ends up on the right side of history politically, when you just talk about this topic of voting, if we're saying you're on the right side of history, if you support the Democrats, then you're, you're wrong when you say it's only black women. Black men, too. Black men always, 80 plus percent of black men vote for the Democrats in every election. Black women are the most loyal constituency of the Democratic Party. But black men are number two. <laughs> You know, I got you. I got you. I mean, it makes me feel hopeful. I mean, I'm just saying, like, as an avid social media user, I feel so down when I see, the, you know, but I guess you're, you know, in thinking about it, if I'm saying that these outlier black women are amplified, same with these, um, these black men. And if I also know to myself that black communities and black people aren't as homophobic as the media tries to make it seem in my own experience, knowing that that is not true. Yeah. Okay, I will give, I'll give y'all some grace, but honey, I'm, I'm telling you, these last several weeks, these black dudes is out of control. No, no, I hear you. I hear you. All right, all right, we got to change. So that was a useful contribution. Uh, so I want to get back to the panel now because we have several more of our assigned questions we need to get through. And so this question here uh, is kind of a uh, part of our conversation, and I don't ask this question cynically, but in all sincerity, the whole notion of a, 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 a black person, a person of color being in the White House, what good could a person of color who manages to get into the White House as the president do for black people? Serious question. Or is it rhetorical? Is that what y'all are saying? Hey man, I'm gonna be nice and say I'm sure uh, they're all doing the best they can do, brother, for black people. And we should be joyful. <laughs> okay, okay, I what got the you. Question, what was the question, what, what can a white person do? What was the no, question? No, can, can y'all see uh, the... Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. what good of, uh, could a person of color, you know, do for um, black people? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that some of the policy stuff that Harris is talking about um, is good, like the child tax credit for people who have kids. Um, I don't I don't 
Um, it's not going to help me, uh, but there's certainly black folk who have kids and don't got no money when they have them. And so <laughs> giving them some money um, to take care of those kind of basic needs, expanding health care coverage, um, where black people's um, health outcomes are uh, really in the toilet, addressing um, the mortality rate uh, with black women, um, and giving birth and, and those complications, the tax credit for home ownership. Um, it seems like there's a lot of things that will help poor people in general. Okay. Um, and do you see what I'm saying? And, um, so it is not necessarily this, like we're doing this for black families. We're doing this to empower black communities. It's like, they're focusing on folks that are poor and, um, have, lower income levels. Um, but you know, of course, uh, the other side is not doing anything for poor people and is just interested in, again, more tax cuts for the rich. And, um, you know, as opposed to Harris who wants to tax the rich more so then they can pay for certain things for all of the American populace. Um, and I think that Yvonne, I think that Dr. Jones is right. Yvonne Jones in the sense that, um, all of these things are buildups to that. I mean, when it comes to like World War II, Nazism, and the rise of such, right? They literally looked to American law and the way that American law treated black people to enact um, the genocide on Jews. Uh, they said, well, let's look at Jim Crow, let's look at enslavement. How did America, right? Which is a alleged democracy do black folk. And so in Nazi Germany, they started with burning the books. They, their assault and their repugnant stance on Jews had everything to do with the fact that they thought Jews were intellectual. They thought Jews controlled um, education, money, access. I mean, the whole point of with Hitler is he was just mad he couldn't get into art school because he was a shit artist. And the art schools run by Jews. And it was his personal vendetta. Um, similar to Trump, who's always talking about what he's personally experienced and how everybody's so unfair to him. And this was uh, my, his personal plight. So, you know, um, they start with burning the books. They start with limiting education. Um, they start doing that to enact like, hey, these are your oh. enemy. They point to an enemy. Your life is bad because of this person, not because of government, not because of what we're doing, but because of this enemy. And right now we're in a moment where black people are the enemy, diversity is an enemy, immigrants are an enemy, gays and especially trans people, they're an enemy too. Um, they're right. all enemies to the state. And the reason why you broke and you ain't got nothing has everything to do with all these other people that they want to say are utilizing all your resources and taking all your money when it's them, when it's them. And then, and, and these fools can't see that whatsoever. I mean, it, so it is, it's a, it's a, We've had the devaluing of undercation for decades, and we've gotten rid of civics at the high school level, knowing that the majority of Americans only get high school degrees. So they're like literally like not educated at all. They don't know how branches of government work. They don't even know how many branches of government there are. They yep. are confused about what a federal government can do for them, don't know what a state government can do. Uh, they just have no knowledge of our political system in general. Um, and who they need to blame for whatever's going on. I mean, right now they're even talking, you know, it was such a better economy when 45 was in the White House. Well, that was Obama's economy. That wasn't his economy. Okay. So when he comes in and everybody feeling good is because of the black man's economy. Okay. Um, and, and what he did, <laughs> you see, so they don't yeah. even recognize that they're like, no, this was Trump's economy. No, it wasn't. Right. And the reason why you're feeling the burden now is because the Democrats had to come in and yet again, once again, try to clean up this Republican economy. Right. And so they don't even understand that administrations and what they do and the decisions they make linger for years. And it takes that next people, those that next administration to come in and either clean it up and make it better or do something different. And we just can't have it every time where there's all these years of cleanup because mm -hmm. Republicans refuse to acknowledge that the majority of Americans are broke and poor. They don't care about that, right? And I would I would argue that in, in some senses, the Democrats don't either, right? Because every political party is like, we're going to rebuild the middle class. They don't give a fuck about the middle class. The middle class is the one who's paying for everybody. Rich people ain't paying nothing and poor people ain't paying nothing. Let me tell you about the tax system, okay, is, is the people who go to work every day. <laughs> and those are the people who's paying the, the lion's share of taxes, right? So it is not broke people, people below the poverty line, you ain't paying tax, they get tax refund. 
and then the rich don't get taxed at all. So the people that work for a living, that's the people who are getting taxed. So this idea, like it just, uh, it's just so frustrating to me because people just are like the Americans who want to comment on stuff that they just know nothing about, and they want to be about. Yeah, that's, and then it's and it's and it's like no, you don't even understand the way taxes work. I mean, every year, every year, I owe six thousand dollars in tax. Where I gotta pay, I haven't gotten a refund, and I don't know how long, right? And 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 so uh, to me, whereas I'm looking at forty five who ain't paid nothing this whole time, it, it's it's maddening to me okay. when I look at when I look at Jeff Bezos who don't pay nothing, who runs yeah. Amazon. Like I mean, it's 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 maddening. So, if you want right. to talk about, yeah. So okay, yeah. Right. I'm going on Renee, I want your thoughts on this 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 subject. Uh, I'm not even sure where you would land on this. Uh, I think you might argue that the, the 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 race of the president actually means nothing. But what are your thoughts on this question? What good could a person of color do as the U.S. president, in your opinion? I won't say that it means nothing, but I don't think it's as uh, important of a factor, depending on how that person sees themselves. But if you, I, I argue, if you are at this point in time running for president of the United States and you get close enough to get it, you your ideals probably don't align with most of the people on this call. Like you yeah. probably yeah. already bought into yeah. particular myths and yeah. things about America, or at least you publicly don't mind buying into that. Now, I will I will say, like, uh, I know some people go, Obama didn't do nothing for black people. It, most, most of it is going to be couched under, this will help the majority of Americans. Because if you actually do go around saying, like, oh, this is going to benefit black people, you will see the most nastiest fights about what those policies are, so, so on and so forth. So I don't necessarily think like, oh, you just being a black person or a person of color is going to necessarily change your opinion, but how you identify yourself in those experiences might. And I don't, I, I would argue, like, I think going back to what Dr. Story was saying, they want to do things that help the general public that will mostly help black people, but they're probably not going to say out loud that they this is what will be supported because they will get a lot of pushback I mean, books have been written about <laughs> about that topic. Like anything they think will support black people, people will go against it. And about those taxes, like the story, um, I paid the most taxes I ever had in my whole life when I was uh, in graduate school. When I made the least amount of money, it was not fun. <laughs> and I know that that's because of the Republican tax bill, because I do know my my government. <laughs> I do know how this stuff works. So um, I actually do think a lot of people, but the rich people, are paying taxes right now. At this, at this particular point. So I guess I kind of, I'm like 75% know the color or the race or ethnicity of a person does not necessarily matter if you're that close to the presidency. You have yeah. to and I, have I, in a and different I kind of way. Say, like, and I wanted to say I agree with that because I was just going on and on about and I didn't answer the direct question. And I totally agree with what Renee's saying. I definitely don't believe that all skin folk are kin folk because look at Mark Robinson, look at Clarence Thomas, look at Daniel Cameron. Right in our. Well, what about this guy? What um, about this guy on the screen? You know, but with um with Obama, um, like I feel like the first presidency with Obama, I was already grown, but I think that um Obama did a lot. Um, I mean, when in terms of like the way that I relate to um, like he did the first time home buyer tax credit, um, and uh, then it, of course forty five comes in and, and completely gets rid of that. Um, I don't feel like the economy was in the tank in the sense I was paying like a whole bunch for gas or a whole bunch for groceries. And you know what? When Obama was in that White House, what's interesting to me is I actually didn't think about my federal government at all. Um, he did LGBTQ protections. I mean, so like I just I, I wasn't worried about my government. I wasn't thinking about my government. And he wasn't having a press conference every single day to make me scared. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what he did or didn't do um but i know personally it, it was um that and not to say, but i don't believe that just because someone is an african american person or a multiracial person that they somehow have pro black interests or uh or that they have an affinity 
or that they see themselves in the same. And I agree with Renee that if, if you're making it all the way to this, right? Because even the other day, Obama said something like he was like, he goes on and on and on like Fidel Castro. And I'm like, hold up um, and now. Hold, hold on now. Yeah, he, he was trying to basically do this false equivalence between Castro and Trump. And I'm like, OK, brother, no. That. Yeah, did you see that? that? And he was like, he go on and on. Just like, I mean, it's like listening to Castro, and it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> so that, that you know, I think Renee is is right in that sense that yeah, just because somebody is black or somebody is biracial, right? Um, that that doesn't mean that in their heart of hearts they're pro black, they're committed to black people, they're committed to black liberation. That as soon as they get in that office, they're gonna do something for black communities. No, um, I don't think I think that's I mean, a false equivalent. equivalent. I mean, let me ask a related question. Uh, you know, is it even possible uh, for someone to become the Democratic Party's national nominee without having absolutely, explicitly having signed on to the whole notion of the U.S. empire and, and its history and all that that entails? Okay, you muted yourself. I didn't Oh, you, you have a dog? Is that a dog, Turquame? Uh, yes. Oh. oh, I love that. You have a little dog. <laughs> Hi. It distracted me. But no, I don't. I think that the only way we can do that is like what Ricky said, if we're imagining a different type of democracy. If we imagine a different type of democracy or we're doing it, but I don't. I don't think, I think that it is the way that the system is established right now. No, I don't think that it would be a possibility to get this super pro-black Enlightened progressive candidate who's going to just anti empire. Yeah, just no, I, no, because you got to sign on. I mean, if you're wanting to run for this type of office, you have to, in some way, believe in empire, believe it to a certain degree. You might not agree with enslavement, you might not think that black people need to be in chains, but you might also think that you know, other things about black people that aren't accurate, true, or right based on the notions of blackness through the empire lens. So I, yeah, I don't, and I, I don't think that, uh, not in this system anyway. Yeah, that's part of what Malcolm was talking about too, I think. Ricky, did you, uh, you got anything for us before we move on to the next panel? Next, well, uh, well we, we come slide. full circle, but we come full circle then with the points that are made, right? If you believe that for a person, even a black person, to get to this point in the American political system as presently constructed, right, and get very close to the White House, that they either have to believe in empire or they have or they acquiesce to the ideology and, and, and machinations of empire, then why are we so, as black people, excited about any of these people? This right. This this was the point I was making from the beginning. So everything is is about political pragmatism for us, not necessarily excitement. To the historical mm -hmm. point, and this was brought up. I think it people really really need to pay attention to this. Why I think it's so important that we as Black Studies scholars push this. Understand the history of autocratic rulers, strong men, and the nations they create, from Mussolini to Hitler, Mbutu. They always attack intellectuals. Right. They always attack intellectuals. They always seize control of the educational apparatus. And so look down, not just at the presidency, but seizure of school boards, mm -hmm. you know, bills across the country. You think these things are about anti-DEI. They're not. They're really about white supremacy, but it's an old playbook. So some of the stuff for me, the arguments that we get, and this is why I'm so pained with what's going on between black men and black women right now to a degree. Um, I'm hoping it's not as deep seated as people think it is. It's a diversion. You know, it's a diversion where we really got to understand the underpinnings of what's happening in, in all of this stuff. And then you look from the University of Louisville, you know, from these schools to school systems to political parties, who are the terminal decision makers, right? The terminal decision makers do not look like us. So, you know, I'm, 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 I can't be excited about that until we truly have some semblance of black power. You have no equality without power. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, uh, shoot, as I look at the clock, time is moving on. So let's move on to our, our next question. So I asked y'all to think about this. Because uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us had a lot of thoughts about the guy as he rose and as he became the major candidate and as became the president. And so I know 
we all have a lot of uh, different thoughts. I had a lot of thoughts about that. But what I wanted to know if you all had an answer to was, you know, things that you thought about this guy and turned out to be wrong about, unless there was absolutely nothing. I got at least one, though, if y'all ain't got nothing. What were you Let wrong about first, this cause... fellow about? <laughs> I was 18, so I'm going to give myself some grace. Uh, <laughs> it's the first, <laughs> my first election that I voted in. And, you know, I was all, I was all into the hope of change. I was like, okay, excited. And then, you know, very quickly realized, like, oh, we just dropping bombs every day? Okay. Like, this is, Obama prepared me. Obama, then I read, what was that? The black myth and looking at what, back to what Ricky, uh, Dr. Jones was talking about, about what it means to actually have power. And looking at, like, the um, Hobson's book about Atlanta and the mayors and, like, okay, you're the mayor, but you don't actually have power over that city, the people who have the money do. Um, and you could try, but it made me really realize, like, okay, I'm fully prepared for this potential Harris administration because I recognize that, like, okay, you're just a figurehead for this empire. You are not really, like, you have, you have the ability to make decisions and things like that, but at the end of the day, you have to buy in to so many things that are, would very much be against what I'm, I believe in. I know I was, uh, I was talking to one person on this call about how, but when it was uh, not, well, that's hold on, that's a later question, but I'll just say, I really don't know what I would have been right about, per se, about Obama, but I was, ex the excitement that, uh, doctor, he was like, I'm troubled by the excitement. That's the last time I was probably excited about an election when I was 18. When I started to realize just more deeply what these things mean, I was like, OK, there's no excitement. It's just, OK, who is a better manager of this place? OK, OK. All right, good. And and, 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 and mention, uh, give us the details on that book that you mentioned, because this is a book that a lot of us would say a lot of people need to read, Maurice Hobson's book on Atlanta. You remember the title offhand? Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's called The Making of the Black Mecca. I don't remember. Dr. Kinsey. That's true. That's, that's true. If Sheryl Lutter's here, she certainly could, 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 could fill us in on that. Um, all right, let's uh, continue. Did you all, uh, were you right about every single thing, Kyla? <laughs> no, like, no, <laughs> no. And like Renee, um, I was. You weren't 18. Don't try it. You I was not 18. No, I was not. I was a grown woman. No, but um, I mean, one. You know, and this is again my superficial American Westernness, but Obama was just so handsome. I mean, that's one part, right? He was young, he was young, he was handsome, um, um, and just the can like his uh, cadence. I think I liked his speaking voice. I like anytime he speaks, I'll be like, you know, um, so. And I was, I was enthusiastic, and I was excited. I never thought that we would have. Um, a black candidate for president in my lifetime. Um, so I was, I was like really, really enthusiastic. But then as the administration went on, um, like I said, he expanded LGBTQ protections in the workplace, but he deported more immigrants than any other president <laughs> before him, right? Um, um, and uh, basically deported more uh, folks than any other president uh, before his administration. Um, and so... There were definitely rotted things that his administration did um, and carried out, which really deeply contrasted this guy who appeared to be everybody and I love everyone and I want everyone to feel included and I'm by right. Right. So like all of this kind of like rhetoric um, around his campaign. I mean, I canvassed for Obama. I've never canvassed for nobody's candidate before. Um, I was very enthusiastic. But throughout the eight years, there were a lot of things um, that his administration carried out that were troubling. The one thing that I can name explicitly was the deportations. Um, you know, and I'm sure that there are other things that I, I don't know, but it's a a part of the reason why he, you know, was a presidential candidate in the first place and a part of that kind of machine. So, um, yes, I would say that, yes, there were a lot of things I was wrong about um, Obama. And until now, like even now, when he said that, what he said about Castro, I'm like, wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? Wait, what? You know, so there were a lot of things he did that were not good. I was not pleased. Um, and yes, uh, my... Um, enthusiasm came from a place of I've I'd never thought that 
there would even be a nominee that would be black period so um i was enthusiastic and and my grandmother too my grandmother was still living um and she was obsessed over obama so part of my enthusiasm had everything to do with that um too you know um yeah and i did i bought into the hopefulness and like I said, the way he speaks, I mean, you know, and I don't go to church, but I mean, I was like, yes, you know, so it was kind of pastoral to me. I'm like, yes, you better do a sermon, you know, um, but then they have speech writers. So, yeah, there were things I was wrong about. OK, well, Ricky, uh, you wrote a whole book called What's Wrong with Obama Mania, even before the dude got elected. Yeah. Now, looking back, were you like 100% correct about everything you said? Was uh, Have you been surprised by anything over the years? No, I wasn't. I wasn't surprised. Well, let, let me say this first, man. My daughter was born in 2008, right? A few months before Barack Obama was elected. And so in her formative years, she was able, whenever, you know, she four or five years old, and when they go, the president said today, so she sees this picture of, of, of this handsome, dynamic, incredibly articulate black man. I, look, that, okay. that, 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 that's huge. That's a big deal to me. You know, I was happy okay. that my child was able, able to see that in the same way when I was growing up in Atlanta, they go, the mayor spoke today. I mean, I'm looking at Maynard Jackson, you know, I mean, that, I think that's important, but from what you're talking about, Tukwame, I've I've talked to a lot of black folk who are very disappointed, who actually paid attention to policy. They actually paid attention to actions. They paid attention to more deportations than even Trump. They paid attention to rampant drone attacks that were more mm. than the issue. You know, they paid attention to a person who was an absolute hawk. I mean, Obama was a hawk as a president. They paid That's a- true to the fact that very rarely was anything mentioned about black people in particular, right? I mean, and, and yeah, you could talk about people sneaking policy in and black people go benefit from, a, from this kind of universal policy, uh, you know, invisible universality theory, but they were disappointed. I wasn't disappointed in Barack Obama because I knew who and what he was before he was elected, right? I, I knew what I was getting into. If you... You know, I, so that's why I find it interesting, you know, when people talk about how opportunistic J.D. Vance is. And it is true that J.D. Vance is incredibly opportunistic. But so is Barack Obama. You look at Obama's betrayal of his political mentor, you know, Alice Palmer. You look at his betrayal of his religious mentor. When you really talk about somebody that's done something for America and black America in particular, I mean, it was it was reprehensible. You look at Jeremiah what, Wright. Is that what you're Jeremiah talking about? Wright? Yeah, I, I was thinking everybody knew who Jeremiah Wright is. You look at Barack Obama campaigning against Bobby Rush, and he got beat down. By the way, in, in yep. that, if you know that history, and you of course have to know who Bobby Rush is and the history of Bobby Rush and what he has meant to the black community. You look at what Barack Obama did to his political opponent for the United States Senate, Jack Ryan, when you know, uh, divorce records were released just a few months before that election and what that did to that man's children. His ex-wife even talked about it. So you just have this history of very ruthless political opportunism. And so if you believe the political ends justify the means, then fine. You know, but people over the years have argued with me about Barack. And I'm like, come on, man, don't argue about things that you have not taken the time to study. So if you actually study Barack Obama, you would not have been surprised by anything that was done. So That's I was not, so thank you for the book plug. What's wrong with Obama Mania? Yeah, go back, read that. I think it's a pretty good book. I heard that, man. I heard that. Uh let's see. Just a couple of things uh I don't want to say about the guy. Yeah, I wasn't disappointed either, because I thought like if you paid any attention to like what the dude was saying that he turned out to be exactly the sort of person who his campaign rhetoric reflected. Uh, He did not campaign as, you know, some sort of pro-black, progressive or any of that sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, I wasn't surprised once he got in there. I was wrong about at least one thing. Um, So, uh, uh, what? I mean, I was aware of him as 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 a new senator uh, from Illinois, uh, prior to the 2004 
uh, uh, presidential election. That's John Kerry versus what, George Bush, the second George Bush. But who is it? Uh, Obama gives like the, whatever they call it, you know, the, 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 the major speech announcing the candidate or something like that. It was kind of his, 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 his coming out party for the nation there. And everybody was talking about, oh, what a great speech, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I mean, I happened to see it because I'm not really in the habit of, you know, watching convention stuff. Or but I said, oh, I'll listen to the brother. And, uh, you know, uh, the phrases, the phrases that I recall uh, were things like, I don't see a red America or a blue America. I just see one America. OK, fine, fine. It was this other one that he said, though. I don't see a black America. I don't see a white America. I see one America. And that was like the big applause line of the night. And I said to myself back in 2004, I said, if white people were smart, they would make this kid the president. But when I said that, I wasn't imagining that it would happen only four years hence. I was thinking, you know, hey, you know, 10, 20 years, well, 10, 15 years down the line, this boy could be president. So I was wrong about the fact that this, uh, that this person of color candidate, right, who had the pretty cadences and, like you say, articulation and all of that, but who had absolutely signed on to the American myth, you know, of, of, of empire and of it, of it being fundamentally not white supremacists. I said, this is your man. This is the face. This should be the face of modern empire. And it proved to be the case. But that's the only thing I was, that's, that's the one thing I was wrong about. Didn't think it would happen so quick. Didn't think it would happen so quick. Because I remember saying to myself and saying to other people, I said, if white people were smart, they'd make this guy the president. But see, uh, I didn't think white people were that smart, you know? But then they turned around and elected Donald Trump. So I think we're back to my original proposition. White people ain't that smart. Can I say something about white people smarts? Okay. Okay. I actually give white people a whole lot more credit than a lot of people do. Here, here's why. And it's around this Donald Trump argument. There are all these people around the Donald Trump argument that want to cast Trump as this con man. Like, you know, he's he's duped all these white people and and they don't know what they're doing. And da, 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 da. I, I think they're intelligent enough to know exactly what they're doing. You know, I don't think Trump has fooled them. I think Trump is their avatar. I think Trump is just doing the exact things that they want to do if they were personally empowered themselves. That doesn't mean it's all white people. True, true. But it's a really, really good percentage of them. Again, it's, and Kyla raised this, this point as people talk about black men. In every election, the majority of white men and white women vote for the Republicans. They did it both times for Trump. Here in Kentucky, look, when they close those polls, at six o'clock or seven o'clock for us and six o'clock out, out in the eastern part of the state, the western part of the state, wherever the hell, they gonna call Kentucky for Trump at 601 or 701. You think he done fooled all these white people? No, he's not fooled them. They're very, very, they're, they're intelligent enough to know what they're doing. It's like these fools at the University of Louisville and other places, oh, we're just not gonna call it diversity anymore, we'll call it equity. Oh, we're onto that, we're not gonna call it equity, we'll call it inclusion. Or we'll call it belonging, or we'll call it people. Them, all these different. You think they ain't smart enough to know <laughs> that you're just playing this semantics game? So I don't think Trump is fooling anybody, and that's my point. None of this is about Donald Trump. All of it is about American white supremacy that is mm. enacted by the brand of democracy that's being pushed off on us. Yeah, I, heard I completely I heard agree with that. I, I agree with that 100%. I hate when people yep. say these white people are silly or they're stupid or they don't get it. I think they exactly get it. I think they know exactly what they're doing. I think that when it comes to white women in particular, they always want to vote on the side of white supremacy, not recognizing that misogyny and patriarchy work in tandem with that system, um, at, you know, and so this is why they put him in the White House and then had that pussy hat march right after he's elected. Like, what, what I mean, how are reproductive rights? And it's like, well, all of y'all voted for him, right? Correct? So you don't understand that white supremacy is akin to misogyny and patriarchy as well. So they want to vote for white supremacy yet keep reproductive freedom 
um, available, not recognizing that those things don't go together. So I know, I think that they know exactly what they're doing. I think they are pleased and excited and enthusiastic to do it. I don't think that they are somehow uh, dumb or silly. Um, I think they know exactly what they're doing and that's why they do it. Um, um, okay, cool. Hey, I just noticed in the chat, Dr. K did come through. Uh, Renee was mentioning the Maurice Hobbs book about Atlanta and it's called Legend of the Black Mecca. And so uh, I've heard, I, I'm not going to claim to actually have read it myself, but I've heard a lot of people say good things about it. So it sounds like something that would certainly be very beneficial for anyone interested in this conversation, for instance. Um, all right, let's uh, let's try to move on because, uh, yeah, we got to wind this thing on down. I think we're going to have to skip some things and may not give enough time to some of these other questions. I did want to, while I had this Obama thing up, I added this stuff. The, I had these little headlines this morning. Uh, the photo is, we, we don't have time to talk about, the infamous beer summit after uh, Henry Louis Gates got arrested in his own house by the Cambridge police. But we'll leave that alone just because we don't have time. Um, but you all referenced some, you all referenced some of this earlier. Uh <laughs> So these headlines here, Obama admonishes black men for hesitancy in supporting Harris. And then the New York Times with their black voters drift from Democrats raising risk for Harris poll show. So this whole rhetoric that people are putting out there, that it's black people's responsibility to vote for the Democratic Party. That that is really a dominant sort of rhetoric that's going around, which, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I must say I reject that. I reject that rhetoric. Uh, let's move on because this is actually related. I did want to get to this. So this kind of relates to, like, uh, I guess, my Obama story from the last uh, uh, question there as well. And this is certainly, what's the word, uh, an absolutely fundamental trope of American political discourse. And that's that, that there's something called the American people. So I just want to ask, do you all believe in that? Does Black Studies believe in that? Discuss. Yeah, I, you, you know, for me, very quickly, to quite man, there's there's this idea, you know, there are all these tropes, these this banter, it's silly season, of course, as people make arguments politically, we've never been this divided. I'm like, bro, have you not looked at slavery? <laughs> 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 have you not looked at, you know, the agenda of the Negro Convention movement? Have you not looked at slaves who were plotting and, and actually rebelling from Denmark Vesey to Gabriel Prosser to Nat Turner, you know? To you know the, the gold culture rebellion, have you not looked at the Civil War? You know, have, have, yeah, right. Have you not looked at Reconstruction? I mean, we've been this divided, um, and and more so. So, what is there is no there there's no there is no uniform America. There never has been any uniform America. But if you want to speak about the single group of people who has most believed in and fought for American ideals. Nobody comes close to black people. That's what black studies believe. If you really understand American history, black people are the ones who have believed in and fought for freedom because we were enslaved. We believed in and fought for equality, right? We believed in all of those things. We actually believe in democracy. We believe that people should be able to vote and have a voice and push agendas forward and make the world a better place. We believe in it so much so that we tell folk to turn the other damn cheek and not even fight folk, you know, <laughs> as viciously as they're trying to oppress us. We're the sweetest people the guy ever put on this earth. So when you talk about American ideals, you know, freedom, justice, all that stuff, that's us. Nobody comes close to us on, on that. Sisters, do either of y'all believe in this concept, the American people? Yes, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly and completely with what Ricky said. I do think that um, <clears throat> I think that black Americans in particular have always been the largest community voices for dissent um, with that dissent being our country. This policy, this law doesn't enact freedom for people. And we've been that. I mean, even consciousness levels uh, when it comes to racial consciousness across the African continent. Right. I mean, and Kwame Nkrumah. Got woke at Lincoln, right? Did he not? Um, you know, um, mm -hmm. this idea of a black consciousness or a freedom consciousness or a politic of liberation, every group subsequently thereafter has followed not only our 
um, idea about it, but also even the form that it takes from suffragist groups, feminist groups, to LGBTQ liberation groups. Um, everybody follows us when they want to think of how do you combat injustice? How do you combat inequality? They always look at the descent of Black Americans to frame their own struggle um, and their own fight uh, for freedom. So I, I definitely agree wholeheartedly with Ricky said. I think that we believe in this country more than this country believes in itself. I think uh -huh. that you know, we are committed to ideas of freedom, ideas of equality in ways that other communities just don't. They just don't. I mean, because, you know, I mean, these other communities, you have, you know, racist gay people. You have transphobic cis gays, right? Um, you have mm -hmm. racist feminists, <laughs> right? You got Susan B. Anthony writing the letter, like, how dare you give this vote to these savages over your sister's daughter, right? That's Susan B. She's, like, supposed to be this feminist maverick, and she deployed that white supremacy right on time, didn't she? Even though she was only a suffragist because of abolition, Right. As soon as 15th Amendment, she's like, oh, so you're going to give it to the Negroes? Oh, watch this. Right. So like, there's always that. So in as much as these other groups try to mimic it, they really wholeheartedly don't believe in equality for all as much as they believe in equality for us. And I just don't think black people are like, I think that black people believe in equality for everybody. Right. Yeah. Um, there's issues that we have to work on as a black community. Of course, it's not as if misogyny and those things don't exist within our communities, but I certainly think that um, we as a people are much more open to learning and thinking about those things critically than I'd say other groups. Renee, do you believe in this concept of the American people that every politician is <laughs> obligated to mouth? Um, I am going to have to agree with everything that Dr. Jones and Dr. Story said. Okay. Um, the only thing I'll add is that when you combine that, you know, belief in equality and trying to make these principles real with the religious beliefs that Black people have, they are the most religious people. <laughs> they really believe in that. When you combine all that, like, it really pushes this, okay, we're fighting to make this thing real. I, I do agree that largely the community pushes in that direction. But do does everybody no not so much i don't think I, and i also think people are willing to ride our backs to some of that freedom and that uh equality so that's what I I hear. yeah i mean i, I hear what y'all are saying i think our large yeah i do agree with what you all are saying in terms of directly answering the question i think i'm gonna stand with brother malcolm and say hell no <laughs> the american people what do you mean Everything Ricky said at the beginning, do you not remember slavery? It said, I won't repeat it. So uh, listen, time is moving on. So uh, I'm going to move on. There's more to say about everything that we've talked about so far. But like I said, we had a little bit of agenda. Let's see if we can get through most of it. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. Y'all uh, <clears throat> were talking about taxes earlier. You know, Kyle was talking about the taxes that she spent and, and, and Renee, too. Uh, and I had paid taxes too. Well, I mean, you know, here's what is going. Well, here's one of the things that it's going for: absolute genocide in Palestine. And and, and, and so, uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the, there's a wider spreading war. Israel is now bombing, you know, various parts, including Lebanon as well. Uh, uh, this particular, well, I mean, well, let me cut to the chase. In fact, let me let me get rid of the preamble. Just ask the question directly. Uh, how does the genocide in Palestine factor into your take on the election? Um, I'm going to go quickly because I think the plan is about to take off. Okay. Um, this was probably the first time I was like, I probably won't vote. Just, just the watching, I remember just trying to make this quick, uh, teaching world history, and they lumped this section about Palestine in with the IRA and terrorism and things like that. And so they, you know, they make it so complicated. But then I looked at the maps and I was like, but this ain't that complicated. This is quite simple. And watching just like everyone say, like, yo, we don't want our money going here. What's up? And people just ignoring it. It's not, it really made me uneasy. And it, I really had to rethink again, even the way I, I already understood this as an empire, but I had to understand that that place is an extension of this empire. And so whatever they do, because we're giving them the money and the weapons, 
what does that mean for me? And I don't want to be complicit in that in any particular way. So, like, for me, this is this is why, like, I agree with Dr. Jones. Like, what is the excitement for? Because <laughs> there's nothing to be excited about. And then finding out how they're complicit in other genocides and other commotion around the world, I am troubled about what all this means if we don't actually directly deal with this one particular place. So, um, that's great. Yeah, well, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate the time you're giving us, son. He's getting ready to get on the plane. So uh, it was very great to have you with us as a part of this conversation. And, uh, you know, safe travels and all of that. Do you have any, perhaps, parting shots? Or is she already gone? <laughs> what do you mean, parting shots? <laughs> oh, I, I had, you know, like the last slide was last word, whatever. You know, it doesn't, you know. Any, any, any closing comments? Nothing complicated or particularly deep, that. necessarily. I I just would encourage, uh, I think everyone has touched on the anti-intellectualism, the book burning, the get over the books. I just encourage all of us, you know, to give a book to a kid and have them actually read it. <laughs> like, because I don't think they're getting the books in the schools because I just left the school this week. It's not happening in there. So I would not trust the schools with educating their children. I would highly encourage you to give them the readings yourself because they're not getting them in the school. That was a good part of it. No, that's cool. That's, that's, I think that's a very important thing to say. So thank you very much. Renee Richardson, one of our Outstanding graduates who PhD candidate even. So uh so yeah, safe travels and all of that jazz. Well, uh 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 all right, the other the you know, uh Ricky and Kyla, uh how does the genocide in Palestine factor into your take? Uh and isn't a vote for either mainstream party, in fact, a vote for genocide? Yes, um, yes. Um, I think that it is certainly um uh Netanyahu is a maniac. Um, I think that Netanyahu believes that all of the Muslim world and domain is his, um, and that he literally wants to do some old manifest destiny type thing and take over all of it, right? I mean, them being in Lebanon saying, oh, well, Hamas is leaders, right? So it's basically let's destroy all of the surrounding countries. Um, and or and then blame it and say that we're doing this in response to October 7th um, and try and make it seem as if it's it's justified and it's not. And I think that. I think that even Israel as it exists is an issue um, and a problem as well. So um, the state of Israel to me is is an issue. The The, the fact that. You have to adhere to a certain religion. You have to be a certain race to even enact your citizenship or be seen as a, a part of that is, is a problem. And I think yeah. that Tanahasi Tanahasi Coates made it explicitly plain um, when he said, "Either you believe in apartheid or you don't. Either you believe in genocide or you don't. Either you believe right. that a certain group of people have rights to a certain land." Because my thing is. I don't think that it's somehow up in the air as to why they decided Israel will be in this land of of brown folks as opposed to Europe, who's the one that turned their back on them, right? So, like, to me, the, even the state of Israel, why is that not somehow in Europe, right? Why is that, right? And that's oh, because uh, they can't enact certain things and do certain things to these surrounding countries that um, are made up of white people. So I do, I think that... Um, I agree with Renee and a lot of my students are are in the same thought. Uh, some of them feel um, that, yes, casting a vote for Harris definitely is being complicit in genocide. And so a lot of them are questioning whether or not to vote. And then there's others who feel as if we'll be able to push a Harris administration in a way that quelches the genocide um, more so than we would be able to push 45, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. If it that. didn't work I, with I, Biden, why would we work with Harris? Exactly. And with Harris, all the messaging has been similar to that, right? That will protect yeah. Israel at all costs. Israel has a right to defend it. All this language that yep. is basically saying we are going to continue to use your tax dollars to fund this genocide. 
Um, uh, neither uh, Hardy and Harris, you know, they are not making it plain that we're going to do an arms embargo. I mean, they keep saying we need a ceasefire deal now. And I just think that that's lip service, right? That's that's them politicking, knowing and recognizing that young voters in particular are absolutely uh, Mm -hmm. disgusted behind the genocide and really don't want to make any moves voting wise to support it. And so they're trying to and give us all this lip service. We we're trying to work on a ceasefire deal. It's Netanyahu. He won't do it. Girl, you got yeah, old right. boy Shapiro. Shapiro signing missiles. Like he's literally like signing the missiles, right? So uh, anyway, and I mean, yeah. and, and then the, the fact that the administration, Harris in particular, and their response, their overwhelming response to student protesters from law enforcement to them saying that somehow protesting being pro-Palestinian makes you anti-Semitic and this false equivalent uh, oh, equivalency Lord. that they're oh, trying Lord. to make it is is repugnant and ridiculous and a lie. Yes, so yes, I, yes. I, I'm, I'm profoundly uh, disturbed uh, by that, you know. Um, no, for real. And, no, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Sorry. We got it. We running out of time, man. So, so, so before Ricky, before I hit respond to it, let me just say just a couple of things right quick. So, I mean, this whole genocide thing, Yes, it goes on with the absolute complicity of the United States government. So our tax dollars at work and all that, yes, but it's not just the government. It's the entire structure of the mass media, uh, including the outlets that claim to be supposedly so enlightened and such like that. The drumbeat of how, I mean, any story that even acknowledges the humanity of Palestinians, right, and, which is very, very rare, that's uh, going to be an outlier so anyway, it's so it, it's, it's a whole system. It's not even just the Democratic and the Republican Party, but I mean, like I said, the entire structure of this whole mass media, which also means the educational system. So there's that. The other point I wanted to make right quick was, I mean, so uh, I mean, so here's something you will absolutely never hear in U.S. discourse about the whole Palestinian question. You know, if Israel wants peace, why don't they give those people their land back? That seems to me to be uh, 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 should be the fundamental starting point. You say that, and you are automatically an anti-Semite and a dangerous and a terror and ever. But to me, it seems so simple. That Lisa, that should be the starting point. You're anyway. Anyway, I said I would stop, but but so we didn't give this enough time. I know, and Ricky, uh, you know, you got even less time on it because we we got to close very soon. Yeah, let me let me let me move quickly. First of all, to claim a people should not be surprised that Americans are not pushing a point of view that somebody should give people their land back. I mean, this <laughs> is, you know, full of some of the greatest thieves in the in the history of the world, and they ain't giving nobody no land back. They ain't even giving black folk no no forty acres of the mule. But you said that America's complicit in it. They're not complicit in it. They active in it. Israel could not yes. be doing what it is doing without America actively supporting what it is doing. Kyla brought this up as, you know, we talk about uh, one of the greatest examples of hypocrisy that we see. You know, we say we're teaching our students to be critical thinkers, right, and engage in free speech and engage the world and engage themselves in global affairs. But you see across the country, at least in on campuses where students are activated, not at the University of Louisville, they didn't do anything there for the most part. But on campuses where students are activated, the campuses by and large have sought to suppress them, not all. But many of them up the road at IU, down at Emory, you, you see it across the country where these people are doing this. Also, the last thing, the, the hypocrisy that folk are involving black folk in. You've probably seen the commercial against anti-Semitism that features Clarence Jones, who was a speechwriter for my Morehouse brother, Martin Luther King Jr. He says the worst thing you can do. Right. The only thing it takes for evil to survive in the world is silence. But then. When Jamal Bowman is not silent, right, you get a pro-Israeli pack, inject so much money into his campaign, boots him out. They do the same thing with Corey Bush. If you watch that CBS this uh, morning interview with Tony Dukapil and what he tried to do with Ta-Nehisi Coates, he was trying to silence him. This is not new. You see what has happened with, with, you know, our, our, our brother Mark Lamont Hill. He's been talking about these issues for years. The Jewish lobby moved very quickly and aggressively to try to get him fired. I mean, and they are still coming after him, even though he has switched schools. So 
This is something that we really, really need to pay attention to. And as Ta-Nehisi said, you either for genocide or you're not. You're for apartheid or you're not. But what's happening in our country, folks said, you can't even talk about it. And if you don't agree with us, then you anti-Semitic. Like if you don't take your ass out and happily vote for Kamala Harris, then you hate black women. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Let me just say, let me say yes. Well, it's about three o'clock, so we really need to wrap up. So I just put this last, yeah, same question I put to uh, Renee. Uh, you got any parting thoughts on the U.S. race? Uh, you know, um, you know, Kyla, you want to vote for Cornell, maybe? Uh, no, uh, no. Ricky, Ricky, <laughs> you want to vote for Cornell? Uh, the Green Party? I ain't and never Jill, heard of Jill Stein, at least Cornell ain't anti-black, but Jill Stein is anti-black, period. Okay, I don't even know much about it. I just heard uh, Butch Ware talking, and he was making a little bit of sense. Um, but anyway, I just put some, these are some other people running for president. I mean, some people would say, listen, you know, you act like it's only the Democrats or the Republicans, but, you know, this is a democracy. There are many people who are eligible and who are running. Uh, so I just wanted to get that out there uh, for what it's worth. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we, we don't hit a, the three o'clock mark. So there any last words y'all want to say? I think now is the time, as Charlie Parker would say. Hey, man, thank you for setting this up to Kwame. Thanks for everybody in the department, affiliated with the department for hanging out. It's a great thing to take, you know, some time on your Saturday afternoon to, to participate in. And these are conversations that are very, very important, not just leading up to this election, but certainly after the election, because our black people still gonna, our people still going to be here. We're still going to be suffering. We'll still have social, political, historical and intellectual concerns. So, hey, you know, stay, stay locked in and, and, and be excited about a candidate. But I encourage people who are excited about Sister Kamala to hold her responsible if she makes it through. I heard that. Okay. Yes, and I echo I echo Ricky. Thank you so much to Kwame for arranging this. I think the speaker series is is great. I really, really enjoyed the conversation um and the community today. Um so yay. Okay. <laughs> yay, Kylo. Yay. And yeah. I don't want people to misunderstand me. I'm not like enthusiastically going to the the cast my ballot. Like I just love Kamala so much and I can't wait. Like, no. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's not that. Well, no, but it's not that at all. Like the last candidate I was excited about was Barack Obama, and that was his first election, not even necessarily the second. So I just wanted to make that last point that I'm not enthusiastic about it, but I am disturbed at some of the critiques. Um, to me, the critiques that we heard today are much more informed, much more spot on. And so the popular critiques that are abound with media's complicity and all that kind of stuff, I think, you know. Yeah. Don't listen to Twitter. Oh, cool. Don't listen to Twitter. I didn't catch that part. I said, don't, don't, don't listen to Twitter. Don't, li don't listen to Twitter or TikTok because that's where they be, and I be having to like put my phone down. But that's yeah, yeah I, that's, I need to leave it alone. Yeah, it's something I know nothing about. It says, as it wouldn't be surprising for you all to to learn. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you all. I thank our panel, Dr. Ricky Jones, Dr. Kyla Story, Renee Richardson. Thank you all very much for uh, for being a part of saying. I want to thank everybody for uh, for hanging out, checking it out. Uh, what I want to say, like I said, we're just getting started with this series. So uh, we got another one coming in three weeks uh, on Asada Shakur's book, uh, Asada, an autobiography. Only confirmed panelists right now is Dr. K, Dr. Kenshin. Uh, but that's going to be dynamic. We do that again. Uh, we're going to come back in December uh, with a, another edition of the Black Studies Canon Conversation. And like I say, you know, we're all really building toward this big thing uh, on Saturday, February the 22nd. Uh, Malcolm X at 100. Uh, we're going to go all day with that. So that that that's anyway, anyway, more to come, more to come from PAS and Friends Conversations in Black. This is merely volume two. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm going to hit this uh, turn off button. So I will I will I will catch you all on the rebound. All right. All right. Peace. Let's see.